Hope everyone's doing well. Welcome back to another lesson. So today's lesson is on something called the PDA Ray Matrix. For most of you, this will be a fully brand new concept. Some of you have actually mentioned this to me and I've told you, you know, I'm going to put out a lesson and then we can build on your understanding. So yeah, this is the lesson. Now I know the name can sound, you know, a bit complicated, let's say, but don't be taken aback by it. It's, it's nothing crazy. It is a new concept that I'm introducing to you guys, but you know, it's not stuff that you haven't seen before. So let's get into it, right? So the first step is what is a PD array, right? PDA array refers to premium discount array. So by now you guys should know your arrays are your order blocks, fair value gaps, you know, your references to price from the algorithm. Premium discount, you know, you can understand it's applied in a context. Now, before we get into the PDA array matrix, I've taken some time out. I've gone over all the arrays, right? Some of which I haven't actually introduced you guys before. So we're quickly just going to run through them one at a time. I'm going to try to keep it pretty simple. Now, let's start with mitigation blocks, right? So with these arrays, what I want you guys to do, you should have a good understanding of every single array, how it forms, what it looks like, right? And how you can enter off it, how you can use it to frame entries. Now, we'll start with mitigation block. I have a lesson on this. In my eyes, it's a very clear lesson. So... You know, if you lack understanding, please rewatch those videos. The same applies to any of the arrays coming up, right? So cool. Mitigation block. Bearish mitigation block is the lowest down close candle in a failure swing high. A bullish mitigation block is the highest up close candle in a failure swing low. Now, the way I describe it to you guys is that mitigation blocks are found at breaks of structure, right? They're a continuation model, let's say, if you're going to use them for entry. Now, how do mitigation blocks work, right? The algorithm forms these, forms the mitigation blocks, and when price returns to them, it allows trapped buyers and sellers, people, for example, if it's a bearish mitigation block, a bearish mitigation block will allow trapped buyers, people who were buying, assuming that price was gonna go higher to, you know, mitigate their positions. If you don't know what mitigate means, it means to remove or get rid of. So, this is where real, you know, let's say true mitigation occurs because people think order blocks is where mitigation occurs. You know, price taps order block, it gets mitigated. That's not how it works. Mitigation blocks is where mitigation occurs, obviously. Now I have two examples for you guys. Um, I hope, you know, they're quite easy to understand. So this is a bearish example to start with. Lowest down close candle in a failure swing high. So you see how we have this swing and we have failure swing high, meaning this high, you know, failed to close above the previous high. The lowest down close candle in this swing high becomes what? Mitigation block. As you guys can see, the lowest down close candle was this, you know, I'm not saying the candle with the lowest wick, the lowest down close candle is this candle. And as you can see, price comes in very nicely, reacts to it, moves lower, right? That's the reaction you expect. Bullish mitigation block. Highest up close candle in failure swing low. Now, essentially, imagine this chart just flipped. As you guys can see, price came up. You know, we formed a swing point here. You know, we try and make another swing point, but of course, price doesn't close below this and we head higher. So, what happens? This is now your mitigation block. This up close candle, as you can see, you know, after price made this high, it reverted, it came back into this trades into this then moves away you can also see you know there's mitigation block here lowest down close candle price doesn't actually come up to this and there's many more examples on these charts right the next one i'm going to talk about is the breaker block so i put the breaker block and the mitigation block in one lesson together previously right i feel like to an extent they're similar you know the way they look is easy to understand together the way they form however is the difference right what happens beforehand the breaker block is only found at market structure shift, right? So looking at my explanation, the lowest down close candle in the most recent swing low prior to high being run in a bearish market structure shift, right? Bearish market structure shift produces bearish breaker block, vice versa for a bullish market structure shift. 
So now if we look at the examples, right? If you just follow my cursor, we have, you know, a low, a high, low, new high, then a lower low, right? And then what does price do? Price retraces into this breaker block, right? This was the previous swing, right? Price retraces into this, then of course reacts. Now this example, I took it on the five minute. Realistically, this would have been a lot cleaner if I'd done it on, you know, maybe the three minute, one minute, but you understand the principle. The way I've taught it to you guys, I want you to be adept with the theory. I don't want you to just say, oh, run a higher, run a low, you know, market structure shift. Yeah, that is how market structure shift happens, but you should be able to identify the swing points, right? What's this swing point called? What's this swing point called? You know, high, low, high, 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 low, high, high, lower, low. So if, you know, you need to write down what a bullish market structure shift looks like, you can instead write out, it will consist of a high, 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 low, whatever, right? However it works. Then you have a low beam run. You should understand it from a theoretical perspective, not just from, you know, this is what it looks like. Cool. Looking at the bullish example, you know, just the same, but opposite. So this time we have a lower high, lower low, lower high, lower low, right? You can see this last week sweeps, higher high, and then you see price retrace back in, taps into this breaker block, right? The highest, the highest up close candle in the most recent swing, then moves away, right? Good example. So these two in specific should be easy to understand. There's lessons on them if you don't understand. Cool. Liquidity voids. So this may be a new term to some of you. And fair value gaps. Now fair value gaps, everyone should know. I have a lesson on this. Fair value gap shows a lack of buying or selling in a specific area, right? Within a candle usually. It can be a cluster of candles. And essentially we say that it's inefficient price action right we want price to be offered fairly at each level to buyers and sellers right a liquidity void is found within a fair value cap a liquidity void acts as a magnet for price a true liquidity void is when a candle open equals a candle's high and a candle's close equals a candle's low picture this for a second right what does that look like that is a candle with no wicks. When a candle purely goes in one direction, that is a liquidity void, right? So now this is a very clear liquidity void. Now why? Right, I haven't shown any examples of fair value gaps. I expect everyone to understand that. If you don't understand that, you most definitely need to revisit that lesson, right? The reason this candle is a liquidity void it is a very one-sided candle. You see how it is, you know, straight up. Look at this. Open is what? The same as the low. And of course, the high is very close, you know, to the actual close of the candle. So this is a liquidity void. There was absolutely no selling in this area, only buying happening. So what does price need to do? It needs to revisit this area, balance this price action. Of course, here it consolidates. This was after a news event. So of course, price like consolidating off, they didn't, you know, go straight back into it. But eventually, I can confirm that price fell, came lower, and of course, filled all of this in. Okay, order blocks, everyone's favorite. Bullish order block. Lowest down close candle before bullish displacement. All right, focus on the word displacement. Now, I've taught you guys displacement, right, requires what? Requires a fair value gap to be valid. Right. Only in some rare cases will we consider um, displacement without a fair value gap. But, you know, 99% of the time, let's say, you know, we want to see a fair value gap almost every time. Bearish order block, highest up close candle before bearish displacement. Right. What is an order block? It's a change in the state of delivery. Right. What, that's what is signifying that there is a change in the state of delivery. After the order block forms, what happens? Price delivers the opposite way. That is your displacement, right? On the order block, the open and the 50% are significant, right?
right? That is where we consider our entries. 50% being the CE, the consequent encroachment. The 50% of all arrays can be important, right? So I've got examples here. As you guys can see, this is the last down close candle. Then we get displacement. You see, one, two, three, four up close candles. And in between them, we've left what? Fair value gap. <clears throat> so you can see that price very cleanly returns to this order block and if we eyeball it that does look pretty much like 50 percent not that i would have entered at the 50 percent here but it does you know look very close to it and then of course we get this strong move away once again right in a bearish example we're counting one two three four up close candles as one order block for example on the four hour time frame this is the hourly time frame on the four hour time frame this would have potentially been just one candle right so then it would have been one order block as you can see price comes up in fact it comes up to the final you know the actual highest up close candle before the displacement with this wick then you get your nice move away right the order blocks with a fair value gap paired with them with the displacement weight will provide you very high probability setups Right, note that down if you don't know that already. Cool. The next one, rejection blocks. I don't actually have a lesson on these. If there's you know demand or a request, I will make a lesson specifically for these. Going over a few things. I don't think they're very you know complicated. So cool. Rejection blocks are only found at the external swing points of a range. You know the external higher the external low the rejection block is the wick of the candle so when we consider a rejection block the actual array is just the wick right that wick will inside it have a lower time frame order block and you know the rejection will be the highest closed candle in the higher or the lowest closed candle in you know the low and I'll come back to this last point in a second. So now this example is actually the same, right? This is the same chart on different time frames. You see from here how this is a rejection block, right? A bullish rejection block. Very clear, you know, wick here. This is at an external, you know, swing point of the range. This is our external low. And you see, we have this, you know, this liquidity engineered price runs this liquidity into this rejection block and then moves away, right? That is how, you know, this trade, we can say, formed. Now, that same chart, right? Remember, I, have, I haven't moved this blue box. What was inside this blue box? Inside this blue box, we have what? A three minute order block, very clean order block. This order block led to what? Displacement. So now this order block is where price returns to and it moves away. In translation, this 15 minute rejection block essentially equals this three minute order block. I know not exactly because this three minute candle is different, but we consider the higher time frame array. So we'll consider the 15 minute order block or the rejection block, sorry. Now, why do we consider rejection block as a potential place to take profit? The way price works, the way the algorithm you know delivers Price can find rejection, or sorry, can find resistance at these points, right? Price may be bearish, right, as seen here. Price may be very bearish. What might happen is it actually reacts here, bounces, and then carries on lower. Now, some of you might think, okay, you know, that's fine. It's going to hit my take profit anyways. Let's imagine the bottom is your take profit. Typically, your rejection block is not that big. You know, it'll only be a few pips. Do you really want to run that risk? Do you get it? So imagine, you know, your trades come from here to here. You're like 95% the way to your take profit. And just for that last 5% you hold, thinking, oh yeah, I'll just wait till price comes to the low. What if this happens and price doesn't come to low? Instead, it starts moving this way and runs your high. What if this is your high time frame array and price starts delivering to buy side instead? Do you get it? So this might not happen always, but I think it's just something, you know, important to consider. If you're very aware of your ranges, you won't get caught offside by this. But, you know, 
If you do recognize something as a high time frame or rare UC price trading into it, sometimes it's worth the headache. Just cut your trade, take your profit, call it a day, you know. Cool. Another example of a bearish rejection block, as you guys can see, at the external end of this range. So this range that I would have posed is from this high to this low. You see price returns all the way up, taps into this rejection block, you get a nice reaction away. Now, what does it do in that process? Also leave another rejection block, which is this candle, right? And it's very possible that I haven't checked this bit, but you know, price could have returned here, run all this by side into this and then move lower. Cool. Okay, now back to the actual lesson. Now, I've shown you guys a bunch of arrays. We know the algorithm is very repeating or very repetitive, right? So when we refer to the PD array matrix, the matrix, we're talking about how these arrays form, right? As I've said in the second point and I mentioned earlier. Now, the most simple example I can give you guys is, you know, your rejection blocks will be found at the external ends of your range, right? You see our rejection block is at the top and the bottom always because what did i say to your rejection block is found you know of course at the external end of the range and it's going to be a wick right cool now looking at this do you see all these arrays in a range every time no it will not happen every time is your range going to be perfect where your mitigation block is always above the 50 percent? no that also will not happen every range does not look like this this is just you know an example to teach you guys a friend of mine actually made this so i'm using it and you know you guys feel free to save it of course i'll refer to the equilibrium and of course we'll refer to time and price let's let's hop on the actual charts and look at a real okay so here i've got a range marked right so this is the range low range high right the first thing you guys should be able to spot very easily rejection blocks on both sides. Positive rejection block here, and of course a negative rejection block at the very top there. We then have order block, right? Order block. Fair value gap, right? This was a fair value gap, and of course there's more fair value gaps in between. It won't always be, you know, perfect. This array, especially the fair value gap, you know, in specific, the order block as well can appear multiple times. And when we look, if we were to, you know, look deeper, potentially on a lower time frame, you'd find liquidity void inside this fair value gap. This candle itself here is a liquidity void. And then, of course, you're going to have a potential breaker block, which over here we can consider this candle. Potentially, you know, we run a low, then run a high. And then potential mitigation blocks higher up in the range somewhere. Cool. You can do the same thing coming downwards. Right, that is how a price range will form. When we have a bearish range, bullish range, they will form in specific ways. If an array is not present, you go on to the next array. It is possible that we form a low without having, you know, a very clear wick. For rejection blocks, right, one point I want you guys to know, I tend to like candles where more of the candle is a wick than body. Right, that to me is a very clear rejection block. Now, I'm not saying that's the only rejection blocks we can trade. Of course not. Sometimes there are very, very clear rejection blocks, as I showed you in some of the picture examples, right? That's fine. You can trade those. But to me, personally, you know, when there is a wick bigger than the body of the candle at the external end of a range, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like alarm bells. Like, okay, this is a rejection block. is a clear example. You know, this is on the table. Then, of course, you have all your other arrays and how they form. So how do we actually use this, right? Very simple. You know where your you know arrays will form. You know where to expect them to form. You now know which order they will form in. So there's two main things I want you to consider, right? Let's just say, right, let's come on a daily time frame. Let's get rid of this picture. Let's say at this point, you know you formed a swing low here, right? And you knew that this range was gonna be bullish. So from here, 
to you know let's just i wouldn't say this range has been capped out but let's just say for a second it has so what can you expect now you know your rejection blocks formed you know your order block it's most likely already there you expect some sort of fair value gap to be given right you want a fair value gap to come at some point and of course within that fair value gap you might find a liquidity void if you're on a lower time frame you expect some sort of mitigation or breaker block over here right and then of course the opposing arrays so how does this work in your favor if you know how the price range forms you know what to expect now when you combine this right this was my next point with time and price oh it's tuesday we formed the like low of the week this daily candle looks like we might have formed a rejection block and so forth do you see how you can frame this okay cool if yesterday framed if yesterday formed a potential rejection block on the pd array matrix right for this range what's the next move right what comes next after rejection blocks we would have had the order block but the order block formed before right so cool now what comes next for a value gap typically so what do you know you're going to get most likely expansion but again you have to combine this with time and price you know your mitigation block would have already been created for this range or your breaker block it already exists on your chart it's just not become a mitigation or a breaker block until you run a specific level level of liquidity for example when we run this high or rather this high you know this highest up close candle becomes right becomes your new mitigation or breaker block depending on, depending on the scenario that's how we can use the pd array matrix you can also right this is a daily example this is your higher time frame you can apply this to your weekly right you know right cool let's just say this is our swing point for example taking an obvious swing point high to low you have specific arrays over here right but you also have this new range forming what do i mean by this new range forming let's assume that euro usd is going to carry on bearish and we reject i don't know here right let's say we reject that here once you're up here you're going to have what a new range when that new range starts forming you anticipate certain movements right anticipate certain things when you combine that with your draws on liquidity you know fair value gaps or whatnot where price is heading to eventually the external low you start to get a very clear idea of how price is forming these ranges what you can expect next you know and you can use that to aid your bias aid your entries aid your trading because you can also apply the same on your 15 minute the first initial example i showed you guys of a range was actually a 15 minute range now this price action isn't great but when you have very very clean order flow right when you have that proper up you know like the example i just showed you guys when you have a consistent you know downtrend very obvious trend you're going high to low high to low high to low you know how many times have i shown you guys that it's just repeating and each time you could have used the PD array matrix, not directly, you know, potentially on the weekly time frame, but potentially on the daily, it would have been a lot cleaner. And that's for you to play around with where the ranges are cleaner. That is it for the PD array matrix lesson. Um, I hope all of that made sense. Like I said to you guys at the start, you know, the name might seem a bit complex to an extent, but it's not a very, you know, complex topic in my eyes. It can be a bit of a game changer if you do enough testing, if you get your eyes used to it, if you understand the principle behind it, if you understand why the algorithm does this, right? Each array that I taught you guys, I taught you some sort of theory behind it and some sort of logic. Apply that logic. The PD array matrix is bringing all of this together. The PD array matrix is essentially how the algorithm delivers. You know, these are the steps in its delivery typically when we're forming a range, when we're heading in a certain direction. Now, I don't expect you to wrap your head around this all in, you know, one go. You might have to go over this a few times and that's fine. There's a lot of concepts you probably will have to do that with. But, you know, it's worth it. Once it finally clicks for you, you don't know which concept will be a game changer for your trading because it's different for everyone. As usual, any questions, any help, just give me a shout. I'll be happy to help and I'll be back soon with another lesson.